Republike Publike zaradi slabe President of the Chamber of Agriculture and Forestry of Slovenia, former deputy of the National Assembly, who cultivates 25 hectares of land on a hill farm, and he actually came straight from the barn to the deputy rooms of our parliament, and he also breeds cattle. And Irina Ule, president of the Association of Female Farmers of Slovenia, an advocate for the improvement of the situation of female farmers, and a woman with many years of experience in practice also in the field of sustainable farming. Anja Magar, president of the Slovenian Rural Youth Association, which represents the future of Slovenian agri agriculture and she's also a controller of organic agriculture and global GAP standard at the Institute for Control and Certification of the University of Maribor. And also Stane Levart, director of the Agriculture and Forestry Cooperative of Slovenske Konice and a member of the board of the Cooperative Association of Slovenia, as well as a man with many years of experience. I would also like to welcome Mr. Primoš Irševar, the director of the Institute Anton Koroševs. So sustainable development is to strike a balance between environmental, economic, and social sustainability. Sustainable agriculture, according to the general definition of sustainability, is seen as environmentally friendly or harmless, at least, in terms of the use of national resources natural resources, economically justified, socially supported, and competitive. We need to think about our posterity. And the beginnings of sustainability go back a long way to the times when people lived their lives with thoughts of posterity, when the word sustainability and the notion of sustainable development were not yet in use, but people simply lived sustainably. Towards the end of the millennium, the term sustainability became a general guiding principle of human development. Its success stems from thinking about the underlying existential problems of humanity, the growing concern regarding the exploitation of natural resources, and economic development at the expense of the environment. In addition to pursuing all of these objectives, we must ensure a decent life for the Slovenian farmer and allow for further development of farms on the basis of sustainability. Before we embark on the first round of questions for our guests, I would like to invite you to take a look at the video address by Sandra Pisaric. Hello and good evening in the name of the whole team of the European Marketing Center for European Studies. 
The Martin Center is the official political foundation of the European People's Party, founded in 2007. We, as the centre-right political foundation based in Brussels, serve to our around 53 member foundations in whole Europe and wider as a link to the policies and the policy-making process in Brussels, but also vice versa. We also serve to bring new ideas from our member states. The Institute of Anton Kodoshek did it once again. In this cooperation, we are going to talk about the sustainable agriculture, food that can feed us all. A very topical debate was recognized once again, the need for it uh, by the whole team of INAC. So I would like to thank to Primoz, Susanna and all involved for co-organizing this great conference, even if only remotely. However, those are the current health and safety restrictions that we need to respect. We also hold, uh, held once again a very successful conference last year that uh, was precedented by a publication on demographic changes in Slovenia and Europe. Your great work was recognized by the Wilfrid Martin Center and hence the award for the best activity in 2020. Congratulations one, once again on this great recognition. I do hope that we will have an opportunity in the future to celebrate this award in Brussels or in Slovenia. Without further ado, I would like to share with you that while doing research and preparation for this conference in particular, I came across some information on agricultural situation in Slovenia that somehow surprised me and somehow I was already familiar with. As a Croatian, I visited Slovenia many, many times uh, and also I'm very familiar with Slovenian landscape, which is remarkable. So, out of 20,273 square kilometers that Slovenia has, out of it, agricultural area occupies 36% and 56% is forestry land. Very remarkable. However, Slovenia has around 69,000 uh, agricultural holdings or farms with a size of 6.8 hectares. At the same time, uh, the average economic size of those farms is relatively small when compared to the rest of the member states of the European Union. And also the information that I came across, which is very interesting is that the share of farm managers is younger than 35 is 4.6 percent again slightly below EU average. The small farm structure, low bargaining power of farmers and moderate factor productivity which is slightly again below EU average, all those imply very low incomes from agriculture for the vast majority of Slovenian farmers. So Slovenia, you could say, belongs to a group of member states with the lowest factor income from agriculture. For example, this information that I found was very, uh, very surprising to me. There are also some other steep, uh, some other problems, such as steep slope, which is a considerable part of biodiversity rich grasslands risk no longer being cultivated. Also, a gross domestic product in rural areas of Slovenia is significantly lower than in the EU rural areas. Rural areas in Slovenia cover almost three quarters of Slovenian territory, but account for 58% of the population and for 58% again of employment. In Slovenian economy, rural areas create 49% of gross value ad added and roughly 38% of the rural households have no access to fat broadband infrastructure. So seeing those problems, one can indeed ask, ask 
is it time to talk about sustainable agriculture when actually the issue that should be discussed is agriculture by itself? Slovenia, I think, is already aware of its problem. Then one of the priorities of the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the EU was CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, and uh, also the current Green Deal plan issued by the European Commission, by the new European Commission. So now, today, actually we want to talk about sustainable agriculture. And in this year in particular, with also uh, COP26, world is pressing more than ever and is refocusing, refocusing somehow its attention on cutting carbon emissions. And while we are talking about this, it is also important to address the work of pioneering farmers, agri-food companies and other stakeholders. Uh, I also hope that today, throughout this conference, we are going to look also in some of the pioneering work across the continent in, for example, um, areas, in, in new growth areas for farming, uh, food and agri-tech, including biologicals, uh, regenerated agriculture, AI and uh, alt protein maybe, and something that can also bring about uh, recording level of investment. I hope also that one of the inputs given by uh, our remarkable guests tonight will be uh, on how food innovation can reduce future climate risks and, and change, but also uh, food waste, which is one of, the, uh, one of the problems that we are going to address during this conference. With Said, said that, I do hope that uh, tonight's conference will bring a uh, spotlight on some of the problems that might not have been identified yet, but also at the same time solutions, some new solutions to uh, the pressing problems uh, of Slovenian farmers, but also farmers across the continent. Thank you again and uh, I would like to congratulate once again to the Institute of Anton Kodoschitz for organizing this remarkable conference and thank you to our uh, distinguished guests tonight. Thank you very much, Sandra, for this contribution. With us in the studio is also the director of the Anton Koroshec Institute, Primoz Jelcevar, who I would also like to ask for a few introductory words. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, welcome at today's conference. I'm very glad to see that you have decided to participate in it. The world and our countries are faced with many an environmental challenge. There are also great differences between the position in which countries are. And this has also been shown in Glasgow at the climate conference, at the COP26. We could see that some progress has been made, but not to such an extent as we would have wished for. We wish to have an economic, just, and socially balanced manner of the measures of the path forward that will bring climate neutrality by 2030. We wish to avoid some disastrous consequences for our cattle breeding and agriculture in general. At the Anton Koroshetz Institute, we are focusing on two main issues, food and uh, farm to fork strategy for the just and environmentally friendly food supply system. And then the other thing is the green and everything green that will 
drive our economic development. Today we have many experts in our midst and together we will try to find solutions for sustainable agriculture that can feed us all. Today is the Black Friday. This is an American symbol of consumerism that major merchants and traders brought to our environment as well. But whether the prices are higher or lower today is not the topic of today's consultation. But we can ask ourselves whether today and in the near future we should go to a shop to buy things that we don't really need. This is the crucial question. In the 1950s, when the merchants were having, were recording losses throughout the year, then they decided to have Black Friday towards the end of the year so that they could have profitable operation so that they didn't go in the red, as they called it. And today we can see that a lot of, lots of times producers, that is farmers, are in the red today, which is a worrying piece of information. This kind of system is contrary to the sustainable and just agriculture principles. I hope that today we will find some answers to questions as to how can we make agriculture sustainable to, for everyone in this chain, in this value chain, for farmers, producers, distributors, and for us who wish to have good food on our tables. I hope that you will enjoy our discussions and consultations and that you will also like our conference and consultation. First, I would like to give the floor to Marco Ziegler. So let us start with the first round of questions. Mr. Franz Bogovic, we have prefer, we prepared the following starting questions for you. What is the current share of organic production in Europe? What proportion is expected by 2030? Or rather, what proportion should we achieve in line with the Green Deal? What were the main concerns in the drafting and adoption of the farm to fork strategy? Where do you see the role of Smart Villages initiative in achieving environmental objectives? while ensuring both the economic viability of farmers, farmers and a sufficient amount of food for the population. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation. And I would also like to congratulate the Anton Koroshetz Institute for last year's award and project. And I hope that this evening we are also going to make a step ahead towards finding a solution to sustainable and viable farming. But before I answer this question, I could say that the opening address by Sandra Pasaric was also very welcome. The sustainable farming that we are talking about should be seen from three aspects, environmental, social, and economic. While we are trying to preserve the, the, our nature, when we are trying to leave the nature that is well preserved to our posterity, we need to know that those who are producing our food need to earn a decent living themselves as well. So. Organic farming and the concept of the development of agriculture are faced with a major challenge. 
namely how can we feed such a great number of people. We are coming close to 8 billion people in the world. When I was born, it was around 3 billion people in the world. So urbanization and increasing population means that we also need to think about the distribution, about how we can bring the food to all those people who need to be fed how we can find the water for these people. So on the one hand, we also have CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, and the strategy from far farm to fork, and many other measures that are combined and joined together in the Green Deal that has recently been adopted. All of these strategies followed the CAP, and they were coming to the European Parliament with a little bit of the delay. And now that we were adopting the strategy for the period of 2023 to 27 in the European Parliament, we could see that the strategies were a little bit behind. On the one hand, as I mentioned, we need to produce food that is accessible in terms of price to the people. And on the other hand, we need to take care of our environment. So in the farm to fork strategy, there are a number of elements that are very ambitious when it comes to agriculture and the environment. And they exert pressure on the environment. For instance, 50% reduction of the use of pesticides by 2030 then the reduction of the use of fertilizers, 50% reduction of food waste. And when it comes to organic farming, the goal is that there should be 25% of all land dedicated to organic farming. Certain percentages were left out in our report but we have kept the basic orientation. In Slovenia, it is expected that 10% of land will be covered by organic farming. The vantage point of different countries is different. In Slovenia, now it is 10%, but it should be increased. So 25% of land in organic farming also means um, higher prices of the produce of the food that's produced. And there is a question whether it will be, they will be accessible to all. And an Austrian farmer pointed out that it may happen that, on the other hand, we might have such an offer, such a supply, that the prices will be brought down. So the orientation is that we increase the amount of land dedicated to organic farming, but the dynamics of it are not yet quite known. Probably in Slovenia, some 16, 17, or even 18 percent already now. So the concerns that we were faced with, and they are confirmed by different studies also from the United States, on what the consequences this could have on agriculture as such and on the prices. And how this will affect the developed world and the developing world in a different manner. So in certain parts, if only certain parts of the world follow these rules, then the prices 
would be that much higher than if the whole world would be following these rules. And another thing that is important here and that we need to make sure, namely, we need to ask ourselves whether others are following our example. We should know that uh, there's a, there are great emissions of greenhouse gas from agriculture. And it means that European agriculture only generates 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So there's this discrepancy, which means that the European agriculture is more efficient also in terms of carbon footprint, as we should know that we are producing by 10% more of food in global terms. At the end, however, it might happen that Europe will need to import food from other parts of the world where these rules are not as respected as they are in the European Union, when they are not following the strict criteria that we have imposed to ourselves, which means that we wouldn't be doing much in this regard. So many dilemmas are ahead of us, but we need to follow this path and we need to be rational in this regard. The smart villages concept is a bigger, is a broader concept. I think that if we keep more people in the countryside, the world will be a more beautiful place so that not all population will be focused on metropolitan areas. Digitalization, better monitoring of disease, following meteorological uh, situation, the use of fertilizers, all these things can help make agriculture more sustainable and can create more and better. On the one hand, we will monitor diseases, new farm machinery will be available. So all this is encompassed in the smart villages concept, long-term care, so by all means, this touches upon the area of sustainable farming, and I'm sure that we will have to be very much active in this area also in the future. Thank you very much. Mr. Alex Irgolic, I also have a challenge for you. I would like to know what is the current share of organic production in Slovenia and what proportion is expected by 2030 or what proportion should be achieved in line with the Green Deal? How does the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Food intend to tackle the timely provision of sufficient capacity or even prevent food from running out? What resources are foreseen for this purpose in the state budget? Unfortunately, we cannot hear the speaker. So the action plan that uh, will be signed foresees that by 2027 we will reach 18% of area devoted to organic farming. I have to say that we are following an ambitious goal and we also expect that this goal is attainable. 
The current situation in Slovenia is that we have almost 11% of agricultural land uh, devoted to agri uh, organic farming, so this gap is bridgeable. But we also need to emphasize that there is more and more demand for uh, organic food, organically produced food, food. So this goes hand in hand. Organic farming is not a way of how to obtain farming subsidies. This is a, a, a specific mindset in my belief. So I hope that the farmers deciding for organic uh, farming will indeed f produce food. What kind of resources or what budget is earmarked for organic farming? Well, if we want to achieve 17% of agricultural land, we will need to invest 6 million euro more than so far in the total balance this will mean approximately 70 million euro. As regards the significance of the food chain, well, of course, this is extremely important. Not only the European policy, but also the national policy has to pursue the goal of making sure that consumers get safe, healthy, and affordable, as well as, why not, Slovenian food. This is what the food chain needs to um, strive for, but also this needs to be followed by the value chain. Uh, this encompasses farmers, uh, processing facilities, and traders. So farmers need to gain a more important role so that this value is distributed more evenly. So this was also followed in our amendment of the Agricultural uh, Act, where we speak about um, prohibited and uh, unfair tra trading practices and similar. When we heard the presentation of the Slovenian farming, we could hear that we have a great number of smaller farms. So our strategy needs to make sure that these farms keep their importance in the food production chain. Of course, it's very important or, or very difficult for individual farms to appear on the market by themselves. So their integration is extremely important. This can be achieved in several manners. The cooperatives were not born for any, for f just for them, their own sake. They were born and created for a certain very important purpose, i.e., to integrate farmers and to sell their products in a collective manner. So this is also how producer groups can be established. But I think that in the system that we have now, there already are cooperatives, and that we should support and strengthen the cooperatives more so that uh, they also can attain a bigger role. In addition to all uh, the funds, speaking about the direct payments, there are also funds from the second pillar, which are investment funds. So they already are available in this current programming period and will also be available in the next programming period. So there will be tenders uh, devoted to integration and to the strengthening of chains. So from this point of view, we expect that we can be successful. But of course, this is a strategy which needs also to be adopted at the level of the state. Speaking about the agriculture and looking into the future, digitalization will, of course, be important everywhere. Mr. Bogovic touched upon the project of smart villages, which is extremely important and needs to be strengthened. But there are also other issues that impact agriculture, particularly modernization. When speaking about the strategies and the reduction of plant protection products, the reduction of other products, of course, here too, digitalization will play a very important role. With the smart use of digital tools, it is possible to fertilize uh, more in a more targeted manner. And this will also reduce costs on the farm. And also, we expect the, uh, this, that this will lead to the cut of the use of PPC, uh, plant protection products. So there are many, and also fertilizers. So there are many projects aimed at establishing these records. Uh, and also aimed at irrigation. So this is also then uh, followed up by the strategic plan, which mentions the project of smart fertilization, smart spraying. And also, this is followed by investments for the pur purchasing of smart agricultural machinery. But with all the existing strategies, which are numerous, we should not 
think that it will be agriculture that will do everything on its own. We need to understand that food production is not self-evident. And consumers, too, must understand that it is not self-evident for the food to be always available on the shelves. So I think that we really need to adopt a smart approach so we are incrementally adjusting to the individual objectives of various strategies. So let me just mention biodiversity. Of course, agriculture will play a part in biodiversity, but this means that not a single wild species can be predominant. Slovenia is a cattle breeding company, so this means that also our farming animals have the right to exist in this biodiversity. So at the level of the state, we need to uh, step together, see what we want to achieve in the future, and then do everything we can so that we are also successful in the end. Thank you very much for your comprehensive reply. And considering your findings, do you think that when the current action plan is being uh, and is discussed for the period of 23 to 2027, whether the food production quantity has been significantly taken into account. Well, you know that we are now in the second round of discussing the strategic plan. This round is completing today, and debates were numerous. The Ministry of Agriculture believes that we are indeed following this direction. This is why we want to support the investments intended for the strengthening of chains, integrating farmers within uh, cooperatives or uh, strengthening links between farmers and the food production industry. But it is, of course, very important for farmers to find and to take ownership uh, for this and to find their place in this strategy. So it is really, really important that all CAP measures will still enable food production. We had a very comprehensive joint discussion, and I believe that this is reachable. But the strategic plan cannot on its own establish the value chain. For example, we have young farmers who are today more of an entrepreneurial mindset, but they need to know that also agriculture will pay and uh, their bills. So this is also the correct mindset. And I would like to underscore once again that I do believe that our strategy goes in the right direction. Thank you. Mr. Roman Zweglic, you are the president of the Chamber of Agriculture and Forestry of Slovenia. What is the agriculture actual share of organic production in Slovenia currently, what proportion of the population can it feed, and how can we improve its way so that it will not uh, affect farmers negatively? And uh, what is the cooperation between your chamber and the government like, given that your members are primarily uh, farmers? What specifically do you think the government should do to reduce farm abandonment? What, are, what could all of this mean for food production? Yes, good evening. I will um, start where the State Secretary completed. Well, all the romantic feeling has disappeared from our agriculture. Agriculture has turned into pure business. In our sector, we are feeling many pressures, many market pressures. But of course, we are the weakest link in the chain. The share of the organically produced food in Slovenia, unfortunately, is disproportionate to the share of area that is cultivated. Of course, this needs to be rectified urgently. But of course, this will require a lot of work. Primarily, we will need to impart knowledge to this part, a lot of knowledge. We will need to help these farms to introduce technological solutions because we need to know that in Slovenia, the majority of this farmland is grasslands. And this is not OK from the strategic point of view. On the other hand, this share of organic farms, if we look at it, we see that these farms are relatively disorganized. 
which means that it is difficult for them to make it to the market shelves. So if we want to bring this food from the farms directly to the traders, then the supermarkets or the traders always ask us, well, what are the quantities, what are the deadlines that they can keep, what is the quality they can produce, what are the deadlines they can keep, and what is the price they can offer? And, of course, it very often happens that this is where all of us freeze. And when it comes to the agriculture as a whole, we are, of course, subjected to Im immense climate change, which is ongoing, and this is a fact. But I believe with all responsibility, and I don't think that much studies are required to prove this fact, that last year, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the atmosphere improved, for example, in Italy considerably. Uh, and uh, livestock uh, breeding, which is uh, now under pressure, this was also the time where the cows, cows were bred, where they were emitting gas, to put it quite simply. So I think this is a stigma for the farmers. I believe that farmers are a victim of climate change, but we are not factors causing such big climate change as is claimed by certain lobbies. Another thing I would like to say, large-scale organic farming. Well, in Slovenia, the great majority of farms pursue sustainable farming the greatest share of farming produce could be claimed to be organic, and there are many other surface areas that we could say that are organic, but their produce is not certified and farms are not registered. When it comes to agricultural sustainability and when it comes to the organic farming, I dare say that we are a step ahead of our neighboring Republic of Austria, but not when it comes to the statistics. But it is a fact that our product is not marketed well, it is not sold well. I know that uh, you mentioned several questions, so perhaps you can repeat them. Well, we primarily wanted to hear more about the situation between the chamber and the government, considering that, of course, you are producing proposals that are based on the specific experience of your members who are mostly farmers. Well, our cooperation is constant and ongoing. But of course, when it comes to the solutions, it is all, not always uh, necessary that our proposals are adopted. So it happens rather often that farmers are not satisfied with the pro proposed solutions. But let me put it this way. Our chamber is the biggest organization of farmers. And of course, we also work together with all our stakeholders. What was most important to me for this last year, since I've served as president of the chamber, is that I am not jealous of any other organizations. And I think that others can support this, uh, for example, Anya, that we really encourage this cooperation and engage in cooperation. But when it comes to the organization and cooperation, when it comes to the negotiations with the parliament, there is something else that is missing in Slovenia. We see that the agriculture does not have a strong political support. We don't have a strong political party which should be ranked number one or number two in the, in the Republic of Slovenia. So we would need such a party that will, would have a bigger impact on agriculture. In the most recent parliamentary elections, we saw that agriculture was actually promoted by the smallest party that made it to the National Assembly. Look, in Austria and also in Germany, the agricultural minister is the second or third most important minister in the country. So the, the countries, the parties compete as to which will own the agricultural sector, whereas here we are just pushing it around. So perhaps I've been quoting an Austrian politician for many times now. Mr. Oman mentioned him also very often. When the, when the uh, Austrian um, 
agricultural party or folks party is not in the government. This is lost time for Austrian agriculture. And what do you think the government should do to reduce farm abandonment? And what can could this lead to producing less food? And do you think that to that the overgrowing of farms is increasing, or are the abandoned farms being leased, and are these areas cultivated uh, by others? Well, taking into account the statistics of the Agricultural Markets uh, Agency, the cultivated land is not decreasing in Slovenia. In fact, this area, surface area, is slightly increasing. In Slovenia, the biggest problem is the building of land, where, and in this respect, we not have the concept of permanently protected agricultural land. I do hope that these lands will be defined with a new legislation. Mm -hmm. And to put it in simple words, we are not really careful and prudent when dealing with Slovene agricultural land. We know about uh, cases such as Magna, and there are many more. Of course, the farms are being abandoned. But what concerns me more is that over the last 10 years, we got 2,000 people less who are insured as agricultural holders. So they are retiring. And if they, they are not owing uh, size, uh, sizable f uh, farms, they are not replaced by new farmers. We have a small portion of professional young farmers. but. This needs to be encouraged much more. This needs to be supported by financial injections. But in Flatland, our farms are not sufficient in size. But of course, we have a big interest there. We have bigger companies who would be interested in taking over such land. But when it comes to the mountainous uh, farms, there the interest is waning because the physical work is more important and also you need more specific agricultural machinery to cultivate such farms. But according to the statistics of the uh, agency and also according to the statistics of the government office, the area in Slovenia is no longer overgrowing. Arable land is not overgrowing, or uh, farmland is not overgrowing. But it is true that we are not paying enough attention to the respect for people cultivating such land. And we should show them respect also in financial terms. Thank you very much for being so illustrative. I do hope that uh, somebody will hear your thoughts and listen to your words so that we will have a representative for agriculture in uh, the Europe, in the Slovenian uh, National Assembly and in the government. Mrs. Mirina, Irina Ule, what is your personal experience with organic food production? What is the role and impact of women in agriculture today? And where do you see room for improvement in the future? We shouldn't turn a blind eye to the fact that the presence of women on farms is the key to continuing farming and keeping younger generations on the farm. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to participate in such a distinguished panel. I am not from an organic farm, but I am following this. And I would wish to have the definition that we follow the definition of organic farming at the level of the European Union. I hear a lot of it, and I hear a lot about our products being bought and taken to, to Austria. And in Austria, they are labeled bio, eco, organic. And that is due to us not having a general EU-wide definition. So this produce is then used in Austria and labeled as such. And I'm, and I'm wondering why doesn't such food stay in Slovenia? Thinking about it, I believe that we have too many ex experts in the field of organic farmer, uh, farming. We all know a lot about organic 
agriculture. Even though not everyone can be a doctor, the same goes for, for farmers. We have too many know-it-alls. We should rather listen to true experts. I'm convinced that in this case, the share of organic products would be much higher. The facts about more land dedicated to organic farming and higher prices is quite worrying. And this might mean that many people will still be hungry. So if we allocate more land to organic farming, I don't think that there is a rosy future ahead of us. As far as I know, farms, these farms mainly provide for themselves. They fall into subsistence farming, but more should be done in this area. You asked the question, what is the role of women in ag agriculture today and in the future? I believe there are two roles of women on the farms. I believe the role of female farmers is very important on the farm. They take care of children, of social contacts. And, and on the other hand, the work of a woman is indispensable, even though some of the work is done by farm machinery. But there's a lot of record keeping necessary on farms, and it is usually done by women. I'm asking women to take a more active role in public life. Even if we take a look at this panel, we can see that there are only two females here, which means that women prefer to stay at home, to take care of their work. But I'm convinced, and I'm an advocate of this, that women should also be present where solutions are sought, where discussions are held. And women should not allow that somebody else decides about the issues that are pressing for us. I'm convinced that no digitalization will be able to replace women on farms, but they can, it can help women, but not replace them, certainly not. The president is laughing here next to me. But uh, yes, uh, your president is uh, a single man. This is why. And allow me to say a couple of words about the Association of Female Farmers of Slovenia. This is a non-governmental organization operating in the territory of the entire Slovenia. We have some trouble finding similar associations and organizations. There are no such organizations covering the area of the whole Slovenia. Now we have the name of uh, female farmers, but we will need to change the name because other females living in the countryside are joining us as well. I have been a president of this association for several decades, and the, our membership has decreased due to the current situation that we are witnessing in the society in general, because 
also some farms are closing their doors. They are closing down. And also farmers are an aging population. I come from a mountainous area. And it is really difficult to cultivate land there. And I'm afraid that overgrowing will start in my region as well. Perhaps it will be different in the flatland. But I'm afraid that there will be a lot of farm abandonment and overgrowing of farms. It is difficult for the elderly to rent out their farms because they feel attached to their farms. Our association also organizes events and gatherings where we always share different ideas. We have culinary competitions. We try to preserve the Slovenian national songs and our national tradition. We have events on the autumn evenings where we introduce ourselves, we present what we do, and we conduct training and education where we familiarize ourselves with the current topics. A lot of knowledge is necessary, also digital knowledge, when living on a farm. And given that our members are not that young anymore, we need to work on that. And we are trying our best. Our association also tries to be present in discussions with the Agriculture and Forestry Chamber and with the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Food, where we try to participate in the creation of certain policies. In addition to the topic of today's consultation, you gave us a good food for thought about the role of female farmers. What about the role of farm families and what about uh, farm pensions? Well, that is a good question. Given the structure of farms, the majority of female farmers do get pensions. They do not have a high, high pension contributions, but uh, they do get something once they retire. But mostly they say, we need to work even beyond getting retired. They used to receive the so-called government pension But now things are not regulated as they should have been. Those women work on the farms their whole lives, and they took care of all family members, but not so much for themselves. But I hope that young women will take care of themselves first and foremost. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you, Mrs. Ule. And now, Mrs. Anya Magar. What do you think is crucial for young people so that they would stay on farms? And how can we achieve this goal? What else should the government and the European Union do in this area to make more young people to decide to take over a farm or perhaps even establish new farms? What impact do you think the Green Deal will have on the state of farms? Will there be more or less abandonment of, of farming? What actions does the Slovenian Rural Youth Association take? to foster a more supportive environment. 
Well, thank you very much. All these questions are very nice, but it is really difficult to answer. The answers are really complex and will require major mindset shifts in order to achieve those goals. Already in the introduction, we heard uh, a worrying fact. We have um, around 5% of youth in rural areas, and they are usually living the countryside. And if we add to that the social issues that they are faced with, access to finance and others, it is even more worrying. But the key is that we need to see agriculture as a business opportunity that will bring economic, social, and environmental security to us. All three aspects of sustainability that have been mentioned so far. Another important thing is, and it should contribute to greater interest of young people to stay on the farms, well, that will be the respect towards farm farmers because food became devalued. How can we achieve that? Well, this is a complex question. If you ask us, it can be done, but an integrated effort will be necessary. The rural youth often emphasizes that we need an integrated intergovernmental and systematic solution. The decision makers and stakeholders need to know that we are ready for change in the field of agriculture and that we are ready for the new strategy that will shape our future. Well, currently we don't have a strategy, but we have a strategic plan. We know that in the past the strategic plan was based on what the European Union demanded of us. Now we had the opportunity to shape it according to our wishes to take advantage of what we wish to do, that is sustainable cultivation of land, to have competitive advantage that we can not advocate because we don't have a strategy in place. So we need a strategic plan that will address the social and economic and environmental aspects. This is key for us. So we, as a country, need to set goals that we will all follow. And as I said in the beginning, the respect for farmers, for farming as a profession, is crucial. The Ministry of Agriculture, of Health, of Science, Education and Sport, all, minist all relevant ministries should come together and embed this in the curriculum. We need to raise awareness on the importance of food for all the people, for the future of our country, so that we need to start in schools so that they will so that people will know from very young age the value of food and they will know how to respect the farmer. Value chains are, of course, important. Value chains have not been established to a great extent in Slovenia, which means that the prices paid to farmers do not cover all the costs that the farmers have on the farm. So we need co long-term contracts that will enable cooperation between all stakeholders and that the prices will be built in such a way to cover the input material, raw material prices. We also believe that a solid value chain is what will give young farmers the trust and the vision to see the bright future in agriculture. And there was a question 
on Green Deal, whether this will lead to farm abandonment or not. Everything strives towards farmers working less but contributing more to environmental protection. But we need to be aware that the more land you allocate to non-cultivation, then less food is being produced. Mr. Bokovic said that the more land will be allocated to that, the higher prices there will be. But we also mentioned the farm to fork strategy, Green Deal, and others. But on the other hand, we also have Mercosur agreements that enable the imports of food produced under less strict conditions and criteria than in Europe. But we have this food in Europe. So I am really worried that the Green Deal will not stop and curb farm abandonment. If we follow this trend and if we don't do anything at the government level, this will become a national problem. Namely, what will we need to do with the mountainous farms? The farms on the flatlands will survive one way or another, but it's the mountain farms that we often brag about and our beautiful surroundings and countryside and farm production there, which is also necessary for tourism. And there was also a question about what actions are we imposing to create a more supportive environment. Well, we enable young people to get more knowledge, to grow personally, because it is important for young farmers to be able to find opportunities in farming, in agriculture, so that even if we go abroad, that we will know how to forge contacts and establish connections. We also wish to cooperate with the Association of Female Farmers with with the chamber and so on. We need to combine and join our knowledge and also enthusiasm for as long as we have it, because we need to be optimistic. I would like to highlight two important projects together with the Chamber of Agriculture and Forestry and the Ministry. We are preparing the second action plan for working with young farmers, entitled From a Young Farmer to a Caring Master, where we wish to tackle issues such as social, social care, better access to financial resources, especially for young people. Then how can we bring agricultural contents into school? What does it mean to be a farmer? How we need to be proud of Slovenian agriculture, and at the same time, make young people aware that they need to be proud of their roots. This is an integrated approach, not only in line with the strategic approach, but in general. And the second project is Nemoč Podeželja, or the powerlessness of the countryside, where we are addressing the mental distress at farms. This is a rather taboo topic in Slovenia. There are several generations living together on a farm, which is a special feature of Slovenia. And on, on a farm, you are at the same time a family member and a worker. And there are many com conflicts occurring due to that. And oftentimes, it happens that we are mainly just working, 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 and we don't have t 
time or we don't take time to talk about it. And then it can come to conflicts that are not good for the future of the farm. And we are bringing on board experts in this field to help us and support us. I think I've used up my time. Just a final thought. So this is the supportive environment that was supported by all key stakeholders already many years ago. But now the, there are some glitches with regard to financial resources. But I'm sure that we will be able to find them and ensure jobs. Well, because you were so extensive, I decided that we will not stop at this point. As a former young transferee, uh, I am still getting email from uh, the um, agricultural rural youth. So I had the opportunity to in get involved in your discussion on the strategic plan. I see that you're very active and that you have a very broad perspective on the issues uh, concerning agriculture. So I would like to know whether you, as young farmers, recognized your role in the strategic plan and were your views heard? Well, I can't say that we were not heard, but un well, quite certainly we would really like to be heard even more. There are still issues open that need to be addressed, but when it comes to the measures earmarked or devoted to young farmers, they are now coordinated with the ministry and with the chamber. So I need to say that our cooperation was really fruitful when we were preparing the startup support on the first pillar or top-up payments on the, on the uh, first pillar. And also in the new programming period, there will be a new intervention for intergenerational cooperation. This will mean that the transferees will get additional financial resources because this will support a, trans, uh, a faster transfer of farms. But we are, of course, very much of the opinion that when it comes to the intergenerational renewal, these funds are insufficient because if you want to encourage the older generation to hand over their farms, we know that 3,600 euros, as is the current plan per year for three years, one in a row, is really, really uh, uh, little. But we are uh, happy that the intervention is envisaged, but we would like to see it better supported with financial means. Thank you very much. And before we move to the next speaker, I need to say that uh, our viewers are congratulating Mrs. Irina via our online platforms for the statement that no digitalization can ever replace women on the farms. Mr. Stane Levert, what role do cooperatives play in implementing the Green Deal, in particular from the point of view of short food chains? To what extent do you assess that the Slovenian cooperatives are successful in fulfilling their mission, and where do you see room for improvement? Regardless of everything, even a well-informed consumer will find it hard to find the time and energy to visit 10 different farms and to buy locally produced food, because it, it is much easier for them to get different products at the same place. Yes, thank you very much for your question. May I first uh, greet all the distinguished guests by way of introduction. I would like to congratulate you all also for organizing this uh, event. I would like to share my broader perspective on your question. I think that when it comes to that even though I'm not that old yet, I have much experience in agriculture. I used to be a milk producer, and uh, over the last three years, I have been assigned the task to manage an agricultural cooperative. So I was elected to this post. Uh, so I was entrusted this task. So I would like to share my opinion. It, I really always want to work to the benefit of my members or my farmers. When we speak of uh, the cooperatives in Slovenia, we speak about 75% of market agricultural production, which uh, then reaches final consumers one way or the other. Of course, we as uh, cooperative or members of cooperatives, we want to see farmers to regain trust in cooperatives. Because I'm proud that Slovene cooperatives knows how to listen to and how to confront the challenges that are 
ahead of us and that we are facing. And when you ask me how our members are seeing my uh, priorities, well, I think that I can borrow the words of Mr. Bogovic. He expressed his concern whether also the rest of the world will follow suit or will there be, will there be a vacuum again because of which we will either be then colonized by other few food producers. So we will stick to the bona fide agreements, but at the same time, an area will be created where we could be flooded by the food produced in the developing countries. So actually, we are colonized by the economy from the West, and it's easy to see what's going on there, where there are no raw materials or semiconductors are lacking. So God forbid something like that should also happen to agriculture. So Slovenian cooperatives are healthy. And I'm really, really pleased to hear State Secretary saying that he's placing high hopes in Slovenian cooperatives. Slovenian cooperatives are ready to meet this challenge and to respond to the challenge. Now, speaking as a farmer, I was expecting to hear about uh, solutions or actually bold uh, approaches. So I would say that, for example, Mrs. Sandra mentioned figures at the beginning that characterize Slovenian agriculture. And in the meantime, she also mentioned worry. And she says that these figures are actually something that we should perceive as a deficiency. But I don't think so. I think that this is, we are all obliged to see these figures as our reality. So this is the task that we need to undertake. And quite certainly, this reality will not be changed by 2027. This reality will neither be changed by 2030, uh, which is the, the delivery time for the Green Deal, or 2050, if you will. So the structure that we have is the result of a low number of tra young transferees. But what do we have? We have a number of old, hardworking farmers who are now lacking strength. And um, this is what we need to resolve. And we have uh, farm, uh, women farmers. So this is something that is our reality. But this is also something that makes us rather specific. So unless we know how to focus our solutions to this fact that will be with us also in 10 years' time, then I think dire straits are ahead. So if I revert back to uh, our cooperative system, and this is uh, the system that is act actually touching on every Slovenian farmer. This means that we really know everything about the problems experienced by Slovene farmers. So when it comes to CAP, then our umbrella organization has expressed its primary doubt whether we are able to address these concerns from the starting point that we have, that is our reality. Or did we make a beginner's mistake of adopting a number of projects and programs, and we need to squeeze our agriculture in them, into them? I know that the Austrian agricultural policy is very proud of the Austrian farmers. It helps Austrian farmers to keep their profession. And I really much hope that with our broad common sense in Slovenia, we will also be able to find answers as to how we can preserve the Slovenian farmers. Our association of cooperatives also has several committees and uh, bodies. And we are calling upon uh, the competent ministry to prepare specific solutions and replies. Having heard today's discussion, I am 
a bit reassured that we do have a common position and that we do see things from the common perspective. But I would like to underscore once again that we are obliged to recognize what our current situation in agriculture is and that this agriculture will not change significantly in 10 years' time. So I'm now director of a cooperative and I am also a member of a processing industry. The experts from the Agricultural Institute showed us some graphs some time ago, which showed very clearly the threats going on in our weak food supply chain. I guess you all saw those graphs that we are having uh, two curves which then actually form a big jaw. So on the bottom part, there is the primary farming, and very close to this bottom curve is also the the processing uh, industry. So this is actually also the processing industry. So uh, there is not much or, or not a wide gap between the producers and the processors, but this gap actually emerges with respect to traders. I know the story with the milk industry, the milk sector, and I know where it all ends. And this is also something that is experienced by farmers elsewhere in Europe, of meaning that we will need to be sincere when it comes to the level playing field and justice. And this will need to be demanded from traders. And of course, if cooperatives buy in 75% of everything produced by farmers, and we deliver this to our shelves, but we run short, but not only us, the, the entire state runs short of strong trading systems. We know that it can be very different if certain state manages um, supermarkets because there are really uh, cheap discount stores located mostly in suburban areas. And there you see cheap produce, produce produced by foreign um, dairies, foreign uh, meat producers, and then just to present it a bit nicer, you will have then a certain produce produced in Slovenia. I think that approximately 40% of dairy in Slovenia is produced in Slovenia, and the rest dairy that is purchased in Slovenia is produced elsewhere. I think that we have a lot of potential to really make the farm to fork happen, because we have very strong folks, um, uh, actually st strong and tools in our hands, but we should just, uh, we only need to use them. And the ministry should provide the financial incentive so that we can get better organized. And if they do so, we are very much committed to do whatever it takes. So thank you very much for listening to my opinions. Mr. Levert, you have partly responded to my question, but still, what are the topical challenges for cooperatives when they are negotiating with other stakeholders in the vertical chain, in particular from the point of view of achieving better prices for Slovenian farmers? Well, what are the challenges? I think that we are all very much aware of the challenges. The cooperative system knew how to provide a very specific reply to that if you follow the situation for several years. I'm happy to say that our cooperative was also one of the promoters. In addition to 10 cooperatives who set up a very bold plan and established its own interest association. Uh, at our first constituent meeting, we got also a high number of applications from healthy farming cooperatives who want to join this interest association. So we will know how to provide an answer to how to present farmers in the strongest role. We are very much critical of the solutions that actually allow for a quick earning, either by selling raw materials or reselling uh, wood or even meat. This does not imply solid and stable 
chains. No, the solid chains are the chains that were constructed over times and are recognized by farmers. It's only it's high time now to make these chains even stronger, and I think that the Cooperatives Association of Slovenia is here following the right track. Thank you very much for this exhaustive information. And we also received uh, some questions ahead of the consultation, first by Robert Bozic, but let me first ask a question from a woman or to a woman, even though this question will be a challenge to all, and namely, ladies and gentlemen, the question is whether the farmer will get a fair payment for the crop so that they can support their family and have the resources to develop his activities in all the required directions. Mrs. Ule, yes, if they produce the correct uh, crops, probably yes, otherwise we will and if we buy the, the food, the produce from Slovene farmers, then they will be able to get the payment. As I mentioned before, farmers need to get fair prices that will cover all the costs of input raw materials. And this is also a call for, to all consumers to buy Slovene. Often, also in pubs, in restaurants, we ask whether they are buying locally produced food that they are then cooking for their guests. So these are the small steps that are necessary for major changes. Mr. Bogovic? Yes, this is the fundamental question of the relationships within the agricultural supply chain. People used to say that this market is going to regulate it, but this has not been the case. In addition to all of these traditional things, I see opportunities also in shorter supply chains for so-called smaller consumers who approach uh, farms directly. The same goes for your cooperative. In the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen many shorter supply chains. I also am quite active in farming, and I have seen examples of that when last year, during the crisis, people registered additional activities on their farms, for instance, cutting off meat on their farms so as to be able to gain some more funds from these activities. But also, as Anya said, and as Mrs. Ule said, we need to build trust in Slovenian agriculture. We should not just wail and be pessimistic, but we need to be able to try and place our produce in our pubs, in restaurants, in our shops. We will never compete with the mass-produced uh, food and crops. But when it comes to small-scale farming and new approaches on the market, I believe there are ways for us to generate farm or greater farm income. When we talk about settlement, the settlement of the countryside, I also find it very important if we even generate half, half a job, not even a one FT8, because this means that we will bring at least one individual closer to the environment to a healthier living. There are many topics that we could discuss, but the important thing is that we build trust and that we bring respect back to the pr profession of farmers. In Austria, this has already been done, but we still need to do a lot of in this field. And now a question for Mr. Irgulic and Mr. Zvenglic. So 
The main question is whether the farmer can support his family and also have the resources to develop their activities. Well, the consumers should be paying a fair price. How we understand this is another question. But the price needs to be distributed in a fair manner. Our ministry is aware of that, but we cannot affect the prices. We are drafting a call for tender where we are going to try to establish the breakdown of, of the price and what it should be like in order to be fair for the farmers. I would also like to stress something else. It is essential. The essential thing will be the respect and the value ascribed to the Slovene food. If there will be an instruction, a guideline that people need to buy 10% of Slovenian food and so on, or 20%, there is a guideline for that. And it's sad that we need to have a guideline. But I have heard it many times when some of our schools or institutions said, well, I would buy more, but I have already used up the 20% that's in the guidelines, as if they couldn't buy more. Thank you very much. Mr. Zviglic, the question was referring to fair prices. Will the prices be fair? I'm afraid that this will not happen in the short term. And we can compare this to the situation in other countries. Food production should not be left to the strictly liberal, globalized orientation. Because if we don't start limit the carbon footprints, taxes, and so on, the Slovenian farmers who, from, from the start, have somewhat larger production costs, will not be able to get fair prices. But we need to increase the prices so that we can assure at least some kind of future. For instance, the price of cattle when I was a child was approximately the same as one kilogram of meat in retail. And today, the more expensive type of meat is around five euro per kilogram, which is not comparable to the price of cattle. And this is wrong. We have come so far also in the automotive industry, but we shouldn't be like in the automotive industry where they are making some parts here, some parts there, some parts somewhere else. Mr. Libert, well, this two-tier approach is one of the options because certain farms can generate income through their niche sales and they can achieve fairer price. But this cannot be characteristic for the entire agriculture. We need to focus or get together in cooperatives and set new proportions and relationships between agriculture, processing industry, and trade. I will not say that cooperatives with our network of shops in different villages is not expensive. It is. But it is only right that we are present there and that we are there because we need to find other ways. This will make us find other ways to sell our 
produce. But this is a process that will take some time. But we hope that already with the current stakeholders, the relationships between them will change. Primary production feels that we are partners with other stakeholders, but others don't see us that way, and this is where there's a glitch, and we need to find solutions to that. Mrs. Magar, you wish to reply to that? Yes, I just remembered the price breakdown and the fair price for a farmer. We should do more to make farmers become aware of our value and our price that is the break-even price for us. Farmers often don't know how to value their work, and they don't know how to calculate it into the price. And this is why the output prices are lower than they should be. But once you set your own value, your own price, the price of your work, then it will be calculated in the price as well. And we should follow this principle. If I touch upon what Mrs. Magar said, I would like to ask you, Mr. Irkulic, what do you think? Should the Agriculture Institute shape this price? Well, they already are, but perhaps, but this is a difficult thing. Of course, we need to rely on the expertise, on the professional opinion to have a balanced uh, system of prices, but then we need to expand it in broader terms. I would also like to know what Mr. Irgulic and Mr. Zweglic think about the following. The price of construction increases when the cost of construction material and labor costs increase. But that's not the case with food. Food prices first increase on the shelves of shops, and it's only a while later, if at all, that the purchase prices from the farmer increase. Why is this the case, and what should be done to change that? Mr. Bogovic, yes, well, of course, it's completely true what you're saying. And with the loads and uh, when certain things get more expensive, then usually uh, they started cal calculating energy prices, transport, but uh, thinking, thinking about own price, as was, mentioning by, was mentioned by Anya, this is what comes last. So how to translate the own price into the final product? This is a major issue in the chain, which leads to delays and to shifts. Another thing which is also problematic in Slovenia is when traders show you the price they get abroad or they show you the price of your colleague, competitor, uh, based in the other part of Slovenia or even in the same vel uh, village. So this then leads to downward auctioning. So. This is uh, a greater self-confidence is absolutely lacking in Slovenia. I said that I have some 7,000 apples at home, but I know also other farmers um, who visited Belgium, which already in 1980s set up the producer organizations. And when I'm visiting my colleagues in South Tyrol, uh, also growing uh, fruit, they have like 12,000 hectares of orchards, and they had 40 cooperatives uh, back then. But then every year or every decade, uh, th this number dropped. And now they, uh, they have two major cooperatives controlling the situation on the market. And this is what happened over the last years. And this is what Roman said, that it's up to 
two to six traders who are actually controlling 75% of Slovenian shelves. So this is where this big concentration has happened. Whereas on the agricultural or farmer side, this integration is much poorer. And we visited Andalusia uh, during the biggest crisis, and they have this cooperative system which is really well developed and includes all types of sectors. When we ask them at the, big, at the end, what do they pay to farmers, and this was at times when the prices were lowest in Europe, they said they agreed that they won't say it because they don't want to uh, cause any commotion uh, in the market. But they were actually paying more than was the market price. This is what came out later on. So these are the stories that we should follow suit and where we can do more. Also, by strengthening our common appearance on the market and by integration. Mr. Zviglic, well, this is the question for 380 million euro, let's say. Why 380 euro? Well, it actually goes along the lines what Franci explained. On the one hand, you have very strong merchants. On the other hand, you have uh, fragmented farmers. And of course, these delays and fluctuations are happening, and they will continue to happen. Why? As I said before, quite simply because the agricultural market is such that we do not set the farm gate prices, we are being decided what our farm gate prices should be. They offered a price, and they said, well, take it or leave it out. Otherwise, I will go elsewhere. We all live in a global village. Uh, the whole world is a small place. So on the one hand, we will need to have supreme organization so that you can get stronger vis-a-vis -vis another stakeholder. Slovene butchers and Slovene processing uh, industry are very much looking for selected quality of meat. Well, farmers should say, well, actually, our selected um, meat or meat of high and selected quality will stay in our barns at, and our uh, stables until the prices reach higher. So in the past, f our farmers were really egoistic and individual because this was the only way how they could survive. But now we really need to make, make a step back and bring our levels, uh, our egos down a notch and work together. So I have no problem if uh, Mr. Levert negotiates for a price of my bulls if he negotiates well. I don't need to negotiate uh, for myself. So once you do your good job, you, you are set to go. But many farmers do not think like that. Mr. Smarkol, a, a former Minister of Agriculture, said recently that in, during the independence years, farmers lost 15 billion euro on account of poor prices. What do you have to say to that, Mr. Levert? Well, perhaps I'd like to first greet Mr. Smerkol. He used to be my boss. He uh, well, actually, I worked for him. Uh, and this figure is, of course, true. He didn't just pull it out thin air. Yes, this is what's missing. When we were establishing our common interest association as cooperatives, I'm a bit uh, younger and a bit more naive, Director. I very often said that we are capable of stating the price of beef in Slovenia and of forwarding it to other stakeholders. But we are not yet in the phase to do so, but we will work on it. For example, when if you follow a normal developmental paradigm, milk is being concentrated along these lines. We have a cooperative diary where I come from, and it deserves a, a specific uh, attention. But I do know what happens when pressures are mounting to increase prices, because I'm also involved via the dairy, and I know how the traders respond. It's 
we would need to, they all know that uh, higher prices are needed, but nobody from having a position of power makes a first step. And unless somebody makes a first step, then the middleman cannot really foot the higher bill if they're not able to channel it to farmers. So currently, it's not worthwhile processing milk in Slovenia. It's better to take it, uh, uh, to transport it to Italy, and to sell it at spot prices. And this is also because the food industry doesn't get what it's worth. And because nobody really wants to make a step back, they are actually all fighting the war of attrition until somebody else switches on the green light when perhaps all of this will be released. So of course, when you see all of these developments from very close by, and you know what I'm saying, this is a chain, but it's not working as a chain. It's actually an elastic, which is you know being strained to one extreme or another. OK, we also got an email question which reads as follows. There are still a lot of food waste, and this cannot be sustainable. What do you think? What would be the right thing to do to address this issue? Mrs. Ule, perhaps uh, you can say what you think, because you here represent uh, female farmers, women farmers. Can you, as ladies on the farm, find the right approach to reduce food wastes? Well, I think that we are talking about two types of food, uh, home food, which is home prepared, home produced, and the food that you buy in bags or is highly processed. When I see the today, today's women, I see that many no longer cook. Also, uh, our children in schools, they get uh, plain milk or plain yogurt, and they are no longer accustomed to it. So they, it's very important that you taste certain food at the right time, and then you will continue consuming it. And additionally, some types of food are really cheap. We are not buying food. Uh, depending on our needs, we see the prices, they're really cheap, so then we just buy it, and then this, lies, uh, this food lies around, and of course this then attracts a certain pest or um, some other animals. And I think it's horrible that 17 tons of bread is wasted every day. I think that upbringing here is the paramount importance. I still take bread on a daily basis if I find it on the floor, uh, and I take it to my animals to eat, And uh, whereas other people throw it away. And I think this is a problem of the attitude, because food is not being respected, producers of food are not being respected, and this then leads to this formula. As was uh, mentioned by Anya, the attitude to the food, to farmers, to farms should be better taught at schools so that there was a generation where everybody thought that what's produced at home was worth nothing. And now it's, of course, uh, this uh, is being reversed, but it will take time. So I really need, I really think that our ch children should be better educated. I think it's better to you uh, to eat less food and to eat more expensive food than to really eat the bagged food or prepackaged food, which I don't think is really healthy. And of course, because it's so cheap, you, you leave it a bit, you don't eat it up, because we were really accustomed to eating everything that was on our plates. This approach is no longer there. Mrs. Mager, it seems that young people more often consumed prepackaged food, fast food. Do you, as uh, farmers, young farmers, also discuss these topics? I was really hoping that you will let me continue uh, from where uh, Irina stopped. And I will also uh, add another comment uh, about food waste. I think it's really, really important uh, how we raise the awareness and how we share our knowledge. My biggest role model 
of not wasting food is my mother-in-law. I have never learned a person who would really not waste any food. Everything is processed. Even if you buy a bagged food or prepackaged food, you will use even that bag for three more times. And this is an example of sustainable recycling, because people were accustomed of living uh, in um, problematic times where things were not uh, uh, to be gotten. But this is something we are not familiar with anymore. And I think that this intergenerational cooperation is extremely important in this respect, because the older generations can give us so much from this point of view. Among young farmers, I don't really see that much of a problem, because it's still f us who represent uh, young people living in the countryside. And we were actually um, living in the culture uh, which it is familiar to us how long it takes to get food from a, sing a certain field to, uh, to a plate. But people living in urban areas do not really know this, are not familiar with it. So really, we need to bring agricultural contents to schools so that we can inform the broader population not only about the importance of food, but also about the problem of food wastes. Mr. Bogovic, your concept of smart villages, does it also entail the food wastes component? Well, the smart villages concept was initiated in the European Parliament also by myself when everybody was talking about urbanization and digitalization. And I became really aware that we will need to build the basic infrastructure if we want to lead easier lives in countryside. I very much agree that no digital uh, technology will replace people. But now I see my brother's home, and uh, his cows are fed by a robot, and a computer decides on the feed dosages. And it makes his life's life easier. Also, the milking of cows. Uh, if you are using robots, it's much easier for the farmers. This is the context that I'm referring to. The food waste pers the issue, well, approximately 30% of the food is wasted globally. But we see that in the less developed world, a lot of this food um, is, becomes worthless or uh, um, broken uh, already uh, on the on the field itself uh, uh, goes to waste already in the field but here of course in the developed world of course what is lacking is the right uh, attitude to food which which was very illustratively put by the former ladies the former two speakers but another experience that I gained from the Netherlands, or actually Belgium, where you know that I was mentioning the biggest producers organization, which brings together 1,200 vegetable producers from uh, Belgium, uh, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, Germany. If a trader wants to partner with this association, they will make an advance payment 14 days ahead of it being delivered, and they will also foot the bill in two weeks. So all uh, supermarket directors are questioning how how is it possible. But yes, because they really build their strength, they build their own negotiating position, and they sell this vegetable at an auction. But when it comes to food waste, approximately four a percent of vegetables on their auction is not sold, but it is moved from the market to a bad bank so that they do not decrease their prices for the next day, whereas this bad bank food actually is then distributed among the population that cannot afford to buy food. So there are other opportunities that are available also in Slovenia and are not yet uh, exploited, because I think that this is how food could really serve the people who need it, but also it can, um, if we tackle this uh, issue appropriately, we can improve food prices and also reduce the, uh, the issue of food waste by 50%, as is uh, the plan by the Green Deal. There is another 
um, person watching us, and he says that uh, self-sufficiency in uh, self-subsistence in food was in Slovenia when it comes to vegetables 67 percent, and when it comes to fruit 48 percent. How could the state increase this percentage in the future, Mr. Irgulic? Thank you very much for this question. Well, this subsistence is always very topical. Mr. Bogovic was explaining this, and we've been mentioning all along this evening that only if we work together, we can get anywhere. Also, if you fund, or if you want to f get finances for food waste, you need stronger uh, producers' organizations. So. I think that salad, if you, if it needs to go to waste, it's better for it to go to waste on the field rather than in, when packaged in the bag, because then we other external costs are avoided, um, transport costs, etc. But farmers need to recognize that agricultural processing is a possible way to go. Of course, if they want to need to act on the market on themselves, they won't be able to to broach this issue. So when it comes to vegetables and fruit production, the area of orchards is decreasing nationwide. The problem is most probably that it's difficult to sell this uh, fruit. Mm. I think that it's, the solution lies in the fact that farmers should be able to plan how much f vegetables and fruit will be needed and will be able to be sold. A representative of the Chamber of Commerce asked me some time ago, when will farmers know the amount of their products? And my reaction was, well, when will you be able to foretell what you really need? But yes, it is really important for us to be better able to plan our vegetable and fruit production. Our production is still seasonal, and it is not planned. And this is problematic, because we, if we all produce salad at the same time, it will be difficult to sell it. So once again, organization is key to increase self-subsistence, self because farmers will know what to produce and when to produce. Well, this piece of information from the statistical office, when you were talking about fruit, you probably thought about you had in fruit in general in mind, not just apples and pears. Well, in this time, we need to know that we've had uh, that the citrus fruit is not growing in Slovenia. And as for other fruit, we definitely have several options as to what grows in Slovenia. But of course, we need to adapt to the climate, not only in terms of technology and protection, but probably the professionals will need to offer those varieties that are more resistant to the coming climate change, which is a fact. And when it comes to vegetables, yes, the production can be increased. But we need to know that the consumption of vegetables starts from a young age. A person needs some um, 10 years before also before producing it, because once you start producing it as a young person, you need at least 10 years to become a seasoned producer of vegetables. And this is hard work. And a lot of vegetables come from Spain and some similar countries where fruit and vegetables are produced uh, in a more intense manner on larger farms. And they have workers on farms, sometimes even Africans who live and work in slave-like manner, in a slave-like manner there. And they don't pay them well enough. So the price is the determinant 
If the prices are fair and smart, then certain farmers will certainly redirect and start growing other vegetables and fruit. But eventually, everything is up to business. Mr. Bogovic, would you like to add something? Yes. I would like to add something on fruit and vegetables. In the area of Kershko, the municipality I come from, the food and fruit and vegetables production mainly depended on the irrigation systems. And now there are large irrigation systems along the Kirka River. So the basic infrastructure that enables this production is necessary. Of course, there are some legislative requirements for water permits and so on. But I remember that we had 200 tons of apples back some years back, but this year we only had 10% of that. Even though today we have more new technology at hand and available. On the 1st of uh, November, we went to Dubai and we presented the concept and project of smart villages. And they showed us from the Emirates how they managed to make a food tech valley in an oasis in the middle of a desert. And they are the ones who are coming to us to share experience so that we can share experience with them so that they will also get the infrastructure for fruit and vegetables production. So we can do it if the Arabs, if it pays off to the Arabs, then it should pay off for us as well. So we can raise subsistence farming, and there are many opportunities for that. I think we can close today's consultation, and I'm glad that we have opened some topics and that we are discussing topics that are important for the future of Slovene agriculture. Thank you very much to Mr. Bogovic, Mr. Irkulic, Mr. Sveglic, Mrs. Ule, Mrs. Magar, and Mr. Levart. Our thanks also go to ETV Television, which hosted us in its studio, editor Bostian Vidmar, Domen Shergan, and also thank you to Anton Koroshets Institute and Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies for Brus from Brussels for organizing this event. Special thanks also go to the project manager, Susanna Lara Krause, who made sure that everything was going smoothly. Above all, a thank you to all of you who have listened to us and who will spread and share the news of our consultation to and with others. Have a nice evening. <laughs>